Well, good evening, and thank you all for coming out for this immersion into Girls of the Golden West. We're so excited to be here and uh, very honored to be part of the Works and Process series uh, here at the Guggenheim. Uh, backstage, there is a wonderful picture of John and Peter uh, back in 1987 when they did a Works and Process, one of the, the first Works and Process, uh, I think it was the second year of it, for Nixon in China. And so uh, this is really coming back full circle some 30 years later. And I want to thank Caroline and Duke and everyone everybody here for their, uh, their great welcome uh, today and having us as part of the series. Girls of the Golden West is a co-commission with the Dallas Opera and the Dutch National Opera, and I'm very happy that Keith Cerny, the general director of Dallas Opera, is here with us tonight. Keith, thank you for believing in this work and joining with us on this journey. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and Roberta Bialek Elliott, who are the uh, commissioning sponsors for this and who have been such great champions of John's music uh, through many years. So, first of all, just uh, a few words of introduction on the, on the panel, then we'll get into the meat of the piece. Um, first of all, of course, John Adams, one of the legendary composers of our time, someone who has really championed a new opera aesthetic in a very profound way with works like Nixon in China, The Death of Klinghoffer, Doctor of Atomic, of course, which premiered at San Francisco Opera in 2005, and The Flowering Tree, and then the Oratorios El Nino, and The Gospel According to the Other Mary. And John has, in each of those pieces, moved the art form forward in very profound and compelling ways. And he finds a message of great humanity in very contemporary subjects and things that connect us to ourselves, to our societies, and to the world we live in, and really shine a light on, on humanity in the present age. So, John, we're thrilled to have you here and very proud to be presenting your work. Uh, Peter Sellers. Uh, Peter Sellers, I think, from, from day one, uh, certainly day one at Harvard, but probably even before then, was, was questioning the very notion of theater and its relationship to society and breaking exciting molds at uh, every step of the way. Uh, through theater productions, through opera productions, through mixed media, uh, he takes the entire fabric of society and uh, re recombines it in different ways and something profound always emerges. I was just uh, privileged to be in Salzburg to see his Clemenza di Tito in which he'd taken a work by you know, one of the most uh, respected composers, Mozart, and, and interspersed elements of the Mozart C minor mass and very few people would have the, uh, the, the, the tenacity to go in and play with Mozart. But Peter did, and something truly beautiful emerged, and that is Peter. That is someone who is willing to get in, get his hands dirty with art, and leave us with things of great beauty. So uh, Peter Sellers is the librettist and the director for Girls of the Golden West, and Peter, welcome to you. And then uh, at the end is David Gropeman, our set designer for, uh, for Girls of the Golden West. Uh, he began uh, actually in San Francisco. He was uh, a graduate of San Francisco State, and he spent some time in opera, including uh, designing the, the premiere of A Quiet Place by Bernstein in, uh, in Houston Grand Opera. And then he moved into the world of film, and uh, he has received an Academy Award nomination for Cider House Rules. Uh, his other films include Chocolat, The Shipping News, Casanova, and uh, he's also the designer for the Broadway hit Hairspray. And so we're thrilled that that he has returned to opera after these years, and uh, I think you'll be excited by some of the design conceptions that you'll see tonight. So, gentlemen, welcome. So tonight we're going to delve into the work, The Girls of the Golden West. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully address a number of elements, and we'll see some visuals, and we will hear some music. Uh, as Caroline said, uh, this is a real chance to hear uh, a taste of this music. This music has not been heard in public before, so you are really in for a great treat tonight. And I just wanted to briefly set the stage for the opera. So the opera follows uh, our protagonist, who, uh, whose full name was Louise Amelia Knapp Clapp. Now, thankfully for us, she went by the pen name of Dame Shirley, uh, which is 
much easier to grapple with. And Dame Shirley was born in New Jersey, uh, but she moved with her husband, Fayette Clapp, who at that point was a doctor in training, to California uh, around the end of the 1840s. He uh, finished his studies in San Francisco, and they decided to go and uh, experience the mining uh, fervor that was hitting Northern California at that time. And so they spent about 18 months up in in the uh, mining camps in the uh, High Sierra, in uh, places we'll talk about in just a minute. And she wrote back these exquisite letters, 23 letters back to her sister in, in Massachusetts. And they're one of the most exquisite chroniclings of the gold rush that exist. And it was a real find, I think, that John and Peter took these letters and have woven them into the, uh, into the fabric of the opera. And Dame Shirley is the protagonist, uh, she'll be played by Julia Bullock in San Francisco. Francisco, but uh, as, you, as you will see as we go through this evening, the, the depth of perception that Dame Shirley had about what was happening, not just the beauty and the excitement, but the horrors and the tensions of the gold rush uh, are all very much in that music. And, and I have to say for me, uh, coming from the UK where history is so abundant, you, you really don't notice it, uh, being in Northern California and where the modern history of California is only 170 years old, it feels like you're reaching back over your shoulder and you can intersect with the very beginnings of, of a culture, of a place. And that, to me, is really what is exciting about this piece, is that we are reaching back from modern-day California into very recent history and some of the excitement that really speaks to who uh, we are now as a, as a people. Uh, so it's, it's a critically important story for San Francisco. Uh, it's a critically important story given what's happening, the energy of the city at the moment. It is, it is a place of great optimism, of fervor, of hope. You have people streaming into that city, uh, jamming it in every corner possible, trying to make uh, quick wealth, uh, believing that anything is possible. And the, the relationship of that energy to the gold rush is, is very profound. And John and Peter have, have really tried to uh, realize that bridge in the opera. So it's, this is not just a historical piece. This is a piece about uh, modern day America as much as it is about our past. But it's also very global. The gold rush was such a mythical time. It's a time that people all over the world feel some connection to, the romance of it, the optimism of it, this sense of pioneering frontiers, frontierism. Uh, it's a piece that, even though for us in San Francisco will, will have a particular resonance, when it goes to Dallas, when it goes to Amsterdam, when it goes on to other places, it'll be a piece that speaks to those communities as well, because the gold rush is just one of those moments in world history that is, is obsessively fascinating to, to people all across the world. So I, I think this is a piece with a really thrilling future. Uh, I'm excited that we're birthing it this year in uh, John's 70th birthday year, and uh, it's, it's really exciting to kick it off here with you tonight. So we open, as Caroline said, on November 21st. Uh, we begin rehearsals in October, October 17, and we had the luxury of a week of rehearsals, early week of rehearsals in August, where we delved into the scenery, but also the music, and uh, it really was a great chance to to get in under the hood, to understand the piece. The singers were all there, the phenomenal cast, two of whom you'll hear tonight were all there. And it was really, uh, we, we thought it was going to be the freak out week, the time that everyone kind of said, oh my God, you know, I, I don't know the music, I need, to, I need to cram before October. And it was just amazing, the, uh, the, the skill freak, with Freak out is with next, next month. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We didn't get it out of the way. So I want to begin by asking John a question about location, because John, although you're not born in California, you've spent much of your professional life there. And you have had, for many years, uh, if not decades, a cabin up in the gold country. You, you have spent time surrounded by the environment of Girls of the Golden West. And I wondered if you could talk about, does that, has that affected the way you compose to be writing about a piece, about a place that you know so intimately? Oh, I think absolutely. Um, I was trying to think back to the very first uh, inkling of what this opera would be. And I, I, Peter and I, I remember we were sitting in a hotel lobby in Los Angeles and you know, I just love making operas with Peter. It's, it's, it's just such uh, a, 
stimulating and complete total immers immersion experience. Um, and we didn't have a topic, and we were just going through these ideas, and none of them seemed to work. And uh, then he mentioned uh, the idea of a, uh, doing an opera about the gold rush. You can maybe explain a little bit about the back backstory of that, but I immediately um, came awake at that because um, I have a very, very strong feeling about California. I've lived there for over 40 years. And as Matthew said, I, I've had this little shack uh, high up in the Sierra Mountains for, I don't know, 35 years or so. And I feel very connected to the environment. And more recently, as I've gotten older, I've become kind of obsessed with reading about uh, California history. Um, I've spent countless hours on these wonderful archival websites that um, universities and libraries create, uh, like the Bancroft uh, Library at the University of California, and um, you know, looking at images of people and just trying to imagine what their lives were like. And um, I had known a part of this story, which is this very shocking story uh, that took place in a little town called Downeyville, which is very close to where my cabin is. Uh, in 1851, a, a, a young Mexican woman, one of the very, very few women in this area, was, um, was hanged. Uh, but basically, she was lynched, and uh, I thought if we could incorporate that story into several other stories, um, we'd have a would have a a work that had great uh, human and emotional and psychological depth, but that also took place in my own backyard. And you know what I love often about uh, great works of art, uh, whether it's a novel, you know, by Thomas Hardy or or Faulkner or uh, an opera by Janáček. Uh, you know, they were writing about their own backyard, and I just felt that this was something that I could do. So, um, yeah, this. I'll show you an example of, of this town, of Downeyville. Uh, well, first of all, well, we'll come back to this stunning image here uh, that uh, I guess would really please the present administration. Um, but to give you an example of, the, of these images, this town of Downeyville, uh, this is what it looked like in 1850 at the time of this opera. Now, today, all of these hills are covered with, with, uh, with trees. So this, this area was completely denuded by um, the population there. But it's just looking at these images and, uh, and going into them and just uh, meditating on them that has been so powerful. Here's another image that comes from an area right where my cabin is. And you can see how, how raw the life was. There are actually a few women here. I think this, I think this image comes probably from about 10 years later. But that's the sort of um, idea that, that really got my juices flowing. I, mean, I, I love the notion of rawness there, John. I mean, it, the fact that Dame Shirley, who was a well-educated woman, was in the middle of all this. You know, it is incredible. I, I love this woman. Um, you know, I've spent two years setting her text and thinking about her. And it gets to the point where you really think you're actually, it's almost like, uh, you know, what people did knocking on tables. I, I feel like I'm talking to her. And she was an extraordinary person because she, uh, first of all, she wrote with enormous, vivid, descriptive powers, uh, describing the, you know, the, the mixture of, of the, 
the the debris and the and the the f dirt and the filth of people trying to live under these conditions, and then she could stand back and describe the incredible beauty, which is obviously not evident in this photo, of of what the Sierras in that part of California is. Uh, and then the other thing about her was that she had this amazing ability to size people up. Um, we need her now. <laughs> so Peter, I want to delve a little bit more into the genesis of the work and, and come at it from the question that I know is, is burning a hole in, you know, in everybody's uh, mind at the moment, which is the title. And of course this title is a take on Puccini's opera of a singular girl of the Golden West, uh, Fanchula del West, which premiered here in New York at the Metropolitan Opera in 1910. And, uh, you know, it's an unashamed connection there. And I wanted to ask, what, what does Puccini's opera have to do with the genesis of the piece? And uh, talk a little bit about the connection that you hope to create by that title, Bridge. Not one thing. <laughs> Uh, I, I was uh, uh, actually, La Scala uh, called me and said, Mr. Sellers, we have exactly the, the perfect opera for your, your great debut here. And, uh, and, they, and they said, Girls, uh, Girl of the Golden West by Puccini. Now, anybody who knows me would not call and ask me to do that. Uh, and, but I said, let's be polite. I thought of my mother's voice, be nice, Peter. So, so I said, let me do the research. Let, you know, and of course, as soon as you start researching California history, and as John said, the invention of California from the gold rush on, which is literally, as the word went out, it was the first time the worldwide media existed. And so word went out everywhere. People came from Egypt, people came from Brazil, people came from Australia, people came from Russia and Scotland, people came from everywhere in the world to California. And so it was the first multicultural society. In the on the planet, and even someone like named Wagner started a ring cycle about looking for gold, and so you know it was truly this worldwide phenomenon at that moment. But of course, black cowboys moving west don't appear in the Puccini opera, and it's weird because the Puccini opera, the libretto, is by David Belasco, the famous Broadway uh, impresario who is famous for putting last word in realism on stage. He would purchase an entire restaurant and put it on stage so he had the absolute realism. And meanwhile, that libretto is pure popcorn. And, and he was born in San Francisco. He was he, Sacramento, yeah. Anyway, just to say, I said to John, let's have the great California opera. It hasn't been written. And meanwhile, California exists as a permanent dream but and a kind of strange utopia even now. And let's activate that. And, and of course, the cast of characters is fantastic, and everybody in the Gold Rush is young. And so we could actually have a cast of the most brilliant young singers from around the world. And so the energy on stage is very, very high and has this kind of youthful blaze to it. And, and of course, the work is like Nixon in China in the sense that it's hilarious. There's just nonstop strange comedy, and then the longer you look, the more disturbing it gets. <laughs> and, and then after a while, it's deeply upsetting. And, but it all moves with this complex, interesting texture. And, and of course, because the libretto is made out of stuff that people wrote, there's Dame Shirley, but there's also the California mining songs, which of course are what Brecht and Kurt Weill were looking at when they wrote Mahagoni, but these are the real things. You know, Americans telling these miners, telling these horrible stories about themselves, and then buying another round of drinks for everyone at the end of the song. And that idea of these super broken people just singing their hearts out, and then laughing, and going back to hoping to get rich tomorrow morning. And that brutality of the situation and the brutality of people towards each other or the strange tenderness. All of that is going on and of course we're once again at that time when people think money is the most important thing in the world and being rich is the most important thing in the world and of course whenever that happens you get this extreme divide between rich and poor and this was really intense. The other thing I would just mention 
is the, uh, Mark Twain is in there because uh, he became a writer also by going out west. And, uh, and I would also mention there are some beautiful poets uh, because finding voices of women is really tricky in that period because women don't enter the historical record in their own terms and in their own voices. And that's very powerful. And the other thing we have is a bunch of Shakespeare because uh, miners uh, in the mining camps performed Shakespeare all the time, and they knew their Shakespeare, and all the great American actors took their companies to the mining camps because, you know, the miners would throw lumps of gold on stage if they liked the show. And so Edmund Booth was there. Every single major American theater company went and toured the mining camps with Shakespeare. And of course, the most frequently performed play was Macbeth. Um, and, um, and, well, Shakespeare was the American playwright. He was the most performed playwright in American history, and certainly in the 19th century. But also, what was going on is an extermination of the California Indians. And extermination was the word used over and over again by the governor of California, the first governor. And there, people would just go out for weekends and shoot Indians. And so, between 1852 and 57 is one of the major genocides. So Shakespeare actually has the texture to deal with this murderous surround, as well as this crazed ambition. And it's very moving to think of the miners, you know, in whatever drunken state, performing Macbeth. <laughs> so all of that's in the mix. Act two begins with this wonderful Lady Macbeth soliloquy uh, performed by Dame Shirley, which will be a spectacular moment. The costume for that is, uh, is sensational. But Peter, before we leave the texts in the opera, there, as you say, there's a huge amount of variety of different voices. What has impressed me from the beginning with this piece is, is that the narrative arc of it is very cohesive. All of these voices are coming together and that the texts are not all from the same period, but it feels like this wonderfully tight drama of a certain place and time. How iterative a process was that, pulling all the texts together? Were there lots of things left on the cutting room floor? Did it come together very naturally? What was your process in that? John and I went back and forth on this piece more than any piece that we've ever worked on. I mean, over and over and over again, there were three major, major drafts and quite different from each other. And it's really, really hard writing and putting together a libretto for this man who is so literary. And you know, and you mentioned California mining songs, the next time you meet him, he's read 45,000 more of them and comes back and says, what about this one, what about that one? John is absolutely, you know, completely devoted to the word. And impassionately, well, there it is. There is, that's, that's how they first look. And then I'll let John take the story from here, actually, because it's, it's a great story. But just to say, um, the arc of it is, is very human, the, 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 the people are telling their stories, but the other thing is it's a very powerful moment in American history, and 1852 is when uh, a very well-known uh, freed slave, um, Frederick Douglass, gives an address in Rochester. What does the 4th of July mean to a slave? And that is one of the greatest moments in all of American rhetoric. It's one of the great American speeches. And so to have our act two is set on the first 4th of July in the state of California, and to be able to have the black character stand up and deliver those words of Frederick Douglass with a power you want to be heard right now in America, and John Adams has made sure it's heard with a lot of power right now. Oh, my own. <laughs> well, well, John, with the with this uh, mining song in the background, uh, just as, with, as Peter was talking about the diversity of text, the characterization in this piece is incredible. You, you are, it's a small cast, it's only seven uh, principal singers, but each of those singers has a completely different uh, set of motivations, a, a history, uh, a, and a soundscape as well. And there's a huge diversity of musical styles woven into this. What were some of the inspirations that, that you drew on, and was this one of the inspirations? Oh, for sure. Um, I don't know at what point we thought of, the, of, of incorporating the, the Gold Rush lyrics. I did not incorporate the music. Um, the music, most of these Gold Rush songs were 
set to very familiar tunes. Uh, in fact, here's another one you can see. Uh, see where it says, after Dark Eyed Sailor. Everybody knew Dark Eyed Sailor. I, I don't know it, but it was sort of like Pop Goes the Weasel or Oh Susanna or Camp Town Races. So uh, I, I ignored the, uh, the melodies, but I took the texts and I set those. So whenever the, the miners chorus sings, they, they sing these, um, these, these uh, Gold Rush lyrics. And indeed, our, one of our main characters that we call Joe Cannon, uh, you've got this song, Joe Bowers, but we changed his name to Joe Cannon because Joe Cannon was the name of the white miner who was harassing this young Mexican woman and who was stabbed by her. So Peter very deftly uh, took this kind of pathetic story. I'm, my name's Joe Bowers. I got a brother named Ike, and he talks about how he came from, from Missouri. Um, back home in Missouri, he has his girlfriend, and he asked her to marry uh, him, and she said, well, you have to go out and make money and get some gold and then come back and then I'll marry you. So he does it, and while he's out there killing himself, digging uh, for gold, he gets a Dear John letter from her saying that she's uh, fallen in love with the butcher. And the butcher has red hair. And then he gets another letter saying she's had a baby and the baby had red hair. So, so it, it's this kind of combination of maudlin, self-effacing humor and, you know, I mean, these songs, they tell a lot of stories. You know, I've had to sell my mule. I broke my arm. They threw me out of Downeyville because I couldn't pay my bill. And um, it becomes, you know, a regular part of the rhythm of the, of the overall piece. Um, and to answer your question about the musical influence, you know, I'm setting these texts that all kind of go da 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 sort of iambic pentameter. And you don't take a text like that and set it to, you know, reversible 12-tone cannons, a crab cannons, you, you, um, <laughs> you try to find a musical language that, that has that same kind of simplicity and directness. So I think in some ways, um, people, you know, who've heard pieces of mine, you know, my orchestra pieces or, or Dr. Atomic will be a bit surprised and taken aback because so much of this opera really is almost feels like these songs. I think the word Earworm is correct. The, the chorus is it's a male-only chorus in uh, Girls of the Golden West, and the, the level of testosterone and energy that these, these songs give that male chorus is, is, is so wonderfully set against the, the poetic text of Dame Shirley and, and the, uh, the other female characters. It's yeah, I, there's some fabulous uh, polarities because Dame Shirley... I mean, she's just uh, not impressed by these blowhards, and and she writes the, she writes about how uh, these guys they work like crazy all week long, um, digging huge holes like forty foot deep holes, uh, looking for gold, and then they get absolutely blind drunk on Saturday night and they fall into the holes and break their legs. <laughs> and, um, you know, all these events happen. She describes uh, the miners, a, a young kid, like a 15-year-old boy, stole some gold dust, and it wasn't really a lot. And, of course, there's no law and order in this mining camp. I mean, there's no justice of the peace. There's no sheriff. And uh, so the miners decide, as a joke, they'll, they'll pretend to hang him just to, you know, scare him. And so they hang him, but nobody has the 
temerity to say, okay, that's just a joke, cut him down. And everybody watches in horror, and the poor boy dies. Um, so it's that, as Peter said, it's that strange kind of combination of uh, humor and gritty existence that's cheek by jowl with these horrific, violent moments of, of, you know, of murder and jealousy and... Uh, and I will say that the, the intensity, it builds into the intensity of one of the great operas, the hanging of Josefa, the Mexican woman at the end, the lynching, this public lynching, it's you know officially scene five of act two, and when we got the score from John this summer, John, for that lynching, wrote 100 pages of music. And the chorus was overwhelmed because the sound of that male chorus turns into something truly terrifying. And the first time we heard that music was four or five Saturdays ago while Charlottesville was exploding. And you realized, all of us realized in the building, it was like hearing Mahogany in 1932. You realize John has actually touched what's going on. And if people want, in 100 or 200 years from now, a time capsule of what this moment felt like to be alive in America, they've got it in this music. And the music goes very, very far and digs and digs and digs and digs. I don't think it was 100 pages. No. It is uh, literally uh, 100 uh, pages, John. They won't come. It is uh, 100. Well, no, no, it's overwhelming because it does have that well, Fox News repeating a false story on the hour <laughs> until the story becomes the story, right? It does do that. And, 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 but it builds with intensity and rage all through that. And, and the different levels of derision and weirdness and at the same time desire and weird yeah. sex of it and all of it is just really disturbing. And you did it. There, there's one more song here I just wanted to show you. Uh, Lousy Minor. And this is, this is the text that the men sing while they're um, getting ready to hang uh, Josefa. And it, I mean, I, here's, a, you know, everybody wants to ask us artists, well, how does your work address the current po political situation? And it's a tedious question after a while. But I do have to say that I wrote most of this uh, in 2016. So, uh, you know, I would take a break and foolishly go online and read the, the New York Times and see um, these terrible things, you know. I would see a crowd of angry, mostly men, screaming, lock her up. And, you know, setting this, this event that really took place, um, where not only did these men lynch a woman, but a Mexican woman, um, you know, you think, well, that's, something that happened in the past and that could never come back. You know, we've, we've advanced as a human race to a point where we wouldn't do something like that again. And, um, of course, that doesn't seem to be the case. The, um, the miners had this wonderful expression, seeing the elephant. And that meant that you'd gone to the mines and you had suffered through it and perhaps you had... Uh, lost everything, but it's a wonderful expression and we use that later. Well, there's a act two, act one is very much about the, the energy, the optimism, the hope and, and the, the real life in the minds. Act two becomes this wonderful progression, a, a, a thrilling but also terrifying progression 
punctuated by these moments of theatrical presentation. As Peter said, it's the first California July 4th in 1852, and the community is celebrating it through these series of, of presentations. And we talked about one being the Macbeth, uh, another one you will, you will hear a little later tonight, and, and then the, uh, there's another one we'll, we'll talk about in a second. But interwoven with that is this growing racial tension, which um, there, was, there was a point, Peter, when you were staging it in, in our chorus rehearsals in August, where you, you see this group of, of angry miners literally just walking across the stage with this just terrifying f fervor in their eyes, this determination to, uh, to reclaim the land. And it was, uh, it was, it was The land that was never theirs, yes. Exactly. And, but punctuated within this are these ama amazing moments of, uh, of theatrical presentation. And one of them we wanted to play for you, we actually have an orchestral recording of this. Um, and this is, this is a presentation not by one of our seven principal singers, but by a principal dancer. Uh, and we have a principal dancer playing the very colorful role of Lola Montez. And John, can you set this up and... Uh, yeah, um, Lola Montez, very briefly was was I, I think she was the the original performance artist. Uh, she was born in um, sometime around the eighteen what eighteen twenties I think uh, in in Ireland and she changed her name uh, to something more exotic and she was sort of like I don't know if she lived during the era of Andy Warhol she would have hung out with Edie Sedgwick uh, she was always with the whatever the in crowd was, but um, she was chased out of uh, uh, out of England. Uh, she married a very young aristocratic uh, guy, like 19 years old, and and his family uh, sued her. So she ended up uh, traveling around the United States. Uh, well, on the way was King Ludwig. Oh yeah, well that's Bavaria. Yeah. She was his lover, yes. and was part of the 1848 revolution. Depending on who you talk to, yes. Anyway, she, um, she toured the gold country, so we thought this was an opportunity to have a choreographic episode. This is my Salome's Seven Veil dance. Um, and this is a description of this uh, dance she did called the Spider Dance, and this comes from uh, an 1851 article in the San Francisco Whig uh, newspaper. Up went the curtain, and on came Lola, fermenting the pit, agitating the gallery, and sensationizing the dress circle, and the spider dance. Has not every son of Columbia witnessed the spider dance? No? Well, then Lola comes in, sails in, flies in, arrayed in a costume to which Joseph's coat could never think of comparing. She stands in an instant full of fire, action and abandon. She commences to dance, and cobwebs entangle her ankles. The myriads of spiders begin to colonize. The spiders accumulate hairy monsters with five clawed feelers and nimble shanks. <laughs> they crawl and sprattle about the stage, invading the fringe of milady's petticoats and taking such unwarranted liberties that the spectator imagines an inextricable mass of cobwebs and enraged spiders. It is Lola versus the spiders. She stamps daylight out of the last of the 10,000 of them and does it with so much naivete that we feel a sort of satisfaction at the triumph. The picture winds up with Lola's victory and she glides from the stage overwhelmed with applause and smashed spiders and radiant with party-colored skirts smiles, graces, cobwebs, and glory. I think, I think we need to hear the spider dance. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
That was a recording made in Snape Maltings in Oldborough uh, by the Britain Peers Orchestra conducted by Marin Alsop and uh, we're using it today with kind permission from uh, Naxos Records and Boozy and Hawks. And I should also note that uh, the Spider Dance uh, was just played about uh, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, at the last night of the proms in London at the end of the proms festival there and it, uh, it kicked off the second half of that uh, raucously fun concert which uh, millions of people in the UK are watching so it was a, a wonderful uh, celebration of John's music. Right next after uh, or before Land of Hope and Glory. <laughs> a natural progression. <laughs> And also, just to say, obviously, Lola had her career because of the ability to delicately or indelicately reveal her underwear. But just, <laughs> just to also say the, the, the whole idea of, of you know, the immigration uh, you know, implications of all of it, it's, it's an amazing, amazing piece. And of course, she was up and down the gold country everywhere uh, with all of her fake identities. And, uh, and she eventually settled there. Anyway, that's a longer story. Uh, um, and um, let's... Well, Peter, yeah. Let's, let's take a look at some of the visual inspirations behind Girls of the Golden West, both from the scenery and the costumes. And maybe, Peter, begin by telling us the implications of this tree stump here. Oh, or David, do you want to do the tree stump? Go. Now that I have all my props firmly in my <laughs> yes. hands. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Peter for bringing me back to the stage and uh, for making the process of designing this beautiful opera so easy. So the first thing Peter did was uh, gave me the title and, um, and sent along this image that John had sent to him uh, as an inspiration for the piece, and which I took it to be as a piece of scenery. Uh, about a month later, Peter sent me a book on um, moving panoramas, a sort of uh, 19th century entertainment of, uh, in many scales, large and small, of uh, moving scenery that people would perform in front of or stories would be told in front of. Uh, so taking those two pieces, uh, first thing we did was we took a field trip to the uh, Big Tree State Park in Northern California, uh, pretty much in the heart of Gold Rush Country, below, south of Downeyville, but very much in the line of the, uh, in the line of the Gold Rush, um, where we witnessed these beautiful trees and the stump that was illustrated back in the 19th century. So, um, there it was, as far as I was concerned, the set. But I thought taking Peter's idea or inspiration of the moving uh, panoramas, that maybe the first act should start with the moving panoramas as Dame Shirley with her husband travels to the Gold Rush country. And then um, saving the stump for the second act in the first 4th of July. Uh, Peter is going to talk a little bit about the stump in a bit, the history of it. Uh, went on to do research. Um, one of the settings portrayed is the Empire Hotel, which had a saloon and a gambling casino. Uh, this was another saloon that we, <laughs> that we, <laughs> that we stumbled upon uh, on the way to Big Tree State. So Park. refreshing. <laughs> looking for a place uh, to have lunch. And um, between this imagery and the imagery of the research, we sort of found our saloon, I would say. Uh, went to the Oakland Museum, looked at their California history display, 
Uh, Peter wanted the stage floor. He said, maybe it should look like a great big oil slick or a great big sort of destruction of the land. And we saw this beautiful piece of granite at the museum, and I took that as uh, my first inspiration for the stage floor. Also looked at the daguerreotypes from the period. I uh, was inspired by the frames, thinking about how they might become a frame for the moving panorama. So the first sketch that I showed to Peter was this environment consisting of the big trees, uh, the oil slick of a floor using the granite uh, imagery, and um, maybe a little simplistically, choosing a gold curtain for the backdrop. Uh, then we added the moving panorama. We see the mule that Shirley and her husband Fayette take across uh, the land to the Gold Rush country. At one point she, um, I won't give away too much of the plot, will I? Uh, there might be a stagecoach involved, a carriage. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and then the saloon. And then the second act with the big stump. Um, I'm going to say that uh, the intention was for the, for, the, for the stage set itself to be as flexible as possible. And I had the great joy of watching, watching the sorcerer Peter Sellers uh, get every bit of use out of the scenery imaginable. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of, oh, uh, I'm sorry, from there we went on to a model. And then the actual building of the set, so there we are. One. Go back one, that's so beautiful, that, that's incredible, right? Yeah. Excuse me, is this a major designer? <laughs> uh, thank you. So, um, here we are. San Francisco uh, scene shop, building the mechanism for the panorama, a couple of the pieces, the bar and the wagon, the moving panorama itself. Uh, the final um, inspiration for the stage floor came from marbleized paper, which then got a little bit overpainted and, uh, and then brought to full life by the scenic artists at the shop. And then there we are on the stump, so the, uh, the crew celebrating their, their final achievement. Uh, we decided uh, to save uh, images of the um, set itself on stage um, for all of you to wait till you arrive in San Francisco to see the opera. <laughs> <laughs> can um, David or, or Peter, can you talk about the implication of that stump for the environmental yes, movement yes, a yes, little yes, bit? Yes, yes, yes. David, that's incredible work, can I just say. And um, John sent me this picture of the stump, which was just shocking. And it turns out it's, a, it's an important moment in, in conservation history. Uh, it, the, the miners were obsessed with this stump. People would make three-day pilgrimages, to, I mean, with the tree. The tree was 24 feet in diameter. People would go take pilgrimages to see it. And then suddenly one day, a bunch of people decided they were gonna cut it down. Why? They had no particular reason. They just thought it would be fun to do. It took them a month. And finally they dynamited it. And it fell over. And then they danced on it, which you saw. And this was one of the major images that John Muir used in the first environmental campaign to say not only were these people stupid enough to destroy one of the most overwhelming, beautiful, and profound things in the world, but then they were stupid enough to dance on it. So that image went all around the world, that lithograph, as an image of environmental destruction, and the first campaign to save the Redwoods began as a result. So it's a, it's, and of course, it's just a beautiful image for an opera and a beautiful image in a time where we do see want and destruction for no particular reason, just so people can dance on something. And so that, that image car carries the whole second act, but in David's amazing version. 
Uh, what I'm going to now do is show you Rita Ryak, the costume designer's research. She could not be here, so I've been deputized to just try and do one or two, take you through it a little bit. But just to say, here's a history we're not used to seeing, of course, people of color. In the 19th century, distinguished, fabulous, beautiful, incredibly poised people of color living as free people in the state of California. With their own style, with their own presence, with their own ease, and with their own intensity. Again, this amazing look, this amazing power, again, a history that you will not see in Puccini, but you won't see in most places, is what, who all was here as real people. And what are they doing? And what's in their eyes? And look at that amazing pomade. I mean, what, a th what an amazing hair. And of course, we're in a real study of bow ties, right? <laughs> Another amazing bow tie. Another amazing pomade. And Frederick Douglass himself, I mean, you don't get more handsome. I mean, that's just spectacular. The flair, the seriousness, the style and the deep purpose, and the rage. And here we have Mexican aristocracy. And of course, these are the Californios, because of course, like a lot of the United States, it was originally Mexico. And these are not people who crossed the border, the border crossed them. And these were the people who were in charge in California. Again, the delicacy, the incredible care, the beauty of these little details with the hair uh, on the sides. I mean, this is not, these are not the crude people we're now deporting. These were cultured, serious, delicately sensitive people. Here is a Chilean family. Again, style. Okay, and here we have the miners. Now, you know, you can't, you can't make these costumes up. This is just so fabulous. You know, and this does really outdo Williamsburg any day. I mean, we're, we're really, those, are, those plaids are so serious. And then that J. Crew belt. I mean, it's just fantastic. These are the ones that want to get rid of Obamacare. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, this is just, these are, th these are spectacular dresses. Look at that shirt. Okay, I mean, the, in the most high-end clothing stores down the street, hello, the cut of that shirt. <laughs> so what we learned in researching the gold rush is in fact all this clothing is ex for sale for like $600 a shirt, <laughs> right? In downtown Los Angeles, in these new boutiques. These, this is such great designer clothing. And what we realized is none of this is like the musicals about the gold rush. You know, paint your wagon, or even what the Puccini opera looks like. In fact, when you look, it, there's a whole world to discover here. And of course, hello, statements in fringe. <laughs> I mean, it's just spectacular, and those like wild pants. Okay, yes, and then, and of course, there were Hawaiians, uh, in, in California, the Canucks were there, uh, and, and again, the presence, just the, the sheer presence of people of such beauty and such range and such scope. And of course, what was denim before Levi's? That's the serious question. Well, again, you see high-end denim that is on sale. That's a $1,200 pair of jeans from down the street, <laughs> right? And again, the cut is so spectacular. Right, there you go, right? And you have to know how to wear it. Okay. <laughs> and then Mexico, right? This is Mexico. Here, this is the aristocracy. These are how classy people went around. And, and, and again, this was the incredible culture of the Californios. And a whole attitude. And a serious bell-bottom pants. Um, <laughs> you know, with spurs. No, but these are the vaqueros, uh, the, the, the cowboys, the ho horseback riders. You can see all of this later becomes cowboy wear, Western cowboy wear, but you can see it was all detailing work, embroidery uh, from vaqueros and leather work. And of course, that also comes up through the pampas from Argentina. 
there you see is a, a native Californian. It's the, this is a little text of that, right? And, and you can look at all the influences that are moving, moving through that image. And there we go, Chile, right? Amazing Chilean uh, 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 writer. Again, style, incredible sense of line, incredible sense of color, incredible sense of poise. None of this looks like the cliches that we've been shown. And of course, look at that shirt. Excuse me. <laughs> the, pa you know, <laughs> the tailoring of that shirt is beyond belief. The pleats, are you kidding? What could you get for that shirt right now? I mean, that is incredible. Serious style. And meanwhile, the pistol work, of course. And with so few women in the gold rush, uh, the need was, of course, for people to play the role. So here's a little gay moment uh, in, in a bar. Uh, and uh, somebody has to s simulate a feminine female presence while the other person pours a drink on his head sitting down. And <laughs> you get the level of human behavior we're dealing with. Uh, okay, again, serious bow tie, right? Outstanding Williamsburg uh, uh, facial hair and, and pants not to be believed. I mean, incredible. And one more time, the cut of the shirt. I mean, th those buttons, amazing, amazing, amazing. Okay, and yes, right, serious Brooklyn counterculture, <laughs> there it is, and yeah, the women, now the women, I mean, this incredible presence, these fabrics are so astonishing, and the way the fabrics are worn, and, and of course, this depth of humanity and emotion that you see in those eyes, and that's what John's music really opens up and what is not in the usual Gold Rush musicals. You know, this is so not Paint Your Wagon. This is a whole nother level of feeling, awareness, disappointment, hope, kindness, hurt. All those things are in this amazing moment. Right? And people with no money, and with nothing, not aristocracy, but look at the emotion, look at the depth of feeling. Again, this is not the empty patriotic stuff we're usually shown. These are people who are risking everything and are facing everything every day. And a kind of madness in the intensity There's an Indian scout in a group of miners. But again, every, in terms of personal style, looking across the group, it's an incredible range. Serious denim work. I mean, look at that cut. Another amazing shirt. And of course, the Chinese and these girls of pleasure the Chinese prostitutes that were up and down the coast and drugged. That's the thing we're used to seeing. And this is, of course, from, from 40 years later. And that's the image that the gold rush is usually presented in. But of course, the, the photos tell another story. Totally different story of how intense life is and how fierce and how people are on the very edge, total edge. And again, another amazing tie. Okay, cutting down these trees. Group project. Okay, here are the Chileans, right? A lot of Chileans and Peruvians came up. And again, you see, a refined culture, incredible delicacy, detail, and sense of personal style. 
Ramon Navarro, whose diary forms a lot of our, our, our opera, was a Chilean who was an astute critic of music and who wrote unbelievably sensitively on a huge range of things and, of course, had all of his claims completely revoked. Again, another Chilean. Style. This was the aristocracy pre-U.S. Entry. And of course, serious plaid work going on in all directions. <laughs> oh my God, those clasps on that jacket, okay? Right? Frogs, right? Serious frog work. See, the miracle of the gold rush is that people were dirt poor desperate, but also would suddenly be rich the next day. So incredibly expensive silks and, and, and cottons and champagnes were brought from Paris to these little California mining towns because somebody could pay for it that day. And the next day they were broke again. So you have this incredible image of total wealth and total poverty, day to day, everything right next to each other. Here are the people we're deporting, and again, that was the style. All of that, of course, becomes Western cowboy wear, but this was the Mexico and the Mexico of the Californios. And again, from Chile. <laughs> Incredible, with the most amazing sarape. And an, a serious Chilean character. White plantation outfit. Serious boots and quite an intense crossing of the legs. <laughs> Subtle, strange hat. Beautiful cravat. I mean, put together. And of course, the belts of bullets, a must. Uh, miners in their underwear. I think we can recognize most of those articles. And black cowboys moving west. That's the real story. Black slaves who were escaped or freed, and they moved west to have room. And uh, this is one of the great pioneering black cowboys uh, who arrived in Northern California. Incredible. And uh, one, one of the seven characters in the opera is Ned Peters, who is, uh, well, tell us a little bit about Ned. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Paganini Ned, who, who drives the stagecoach that takes uh, Dame Shirley uh, up into gold country and, um, and later becomes uh, a cook, and uh, they together make a fabulous coronation dinner, and he's the person who steps forward with the Frederick Douglass speech in the heart of the lynching. Crazy miners, right on the edge, and founding their own funky secret societies. <laughs> right, there it is, okay? And again, the cut of that shirt, tunic or whatever it is, I mean, look at that. Like, where does that come from? Okay, good. And again, look at those eyes, look at that style, look at that presence. Right? Guys. Total guys in society without women. And yes, women in the middle of that. And of course, the strange hand of death on her shoulder. <laughs> Let those fingernails grow. I mean, what stories do these photographs tell that, you know, is left out of most history books? the emotional temperature. And I asked Rita to include something fun, uh, and this is for the 4th of July. <laughs> A fun little 4th of July outfit um, for our dancing girls. And let's get into the fabrics. This is a Dame Shirley image for us. Look at what that fabric is doing. That fabric is losing its mind over and over again and then in pleats. 
spiraling out of control and going to the last level of insanity, <laughs> but saying, no, no, I'm just a perfectly put together Victorian lady. What? <laughs> it is madness itself. And the ladies of ill repute who know who they are and are putting it out there. Very intense stuff. Wow, that skirt. And for our 4th of July celebration, a adorable Sweet Liberty doll. We're going to try and reproduce that costume. <laughs> See where it gets us. Oh, we should mention the spider dance and all of our beautiful dances are going to be choreographed by John Hagenbotham, who you know from this series, the fabulous choreographer. So John will be totally part of the team of this. And there is Ellen Terry as Lady Macbeth. So that's a real outfit for Julia Bullock to wear. I mean, just stunning level of what Shakespeare was in the 19th century. Like, totally go into trance with this wild, strange, out-of-body experience. And all of those colors and costumes and velours and, and strange brocades moving across centuries into some weird druidic place and forward, you know, into a strange modernity. Next stop is Salome and all that stuff. And John's lousy minor, there it is. I'm a lousy minor. Look at that incredible broken body with all of that crazy, crazy fringe. Leather, 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 and that hat, and those eyes. Again, not the usual image you see. Here are the modern reproductions of authentic uh, uh, fabrics of the period. So this is Dame Shirley's coronation dinner outfit, <laughs> is those, those fabrics put together into an incredible um, series of pleats. Like, you can just get the fantasy exploding everywhere, and this is the 19th century they don't tell you about or show you. Oh my God. Right? Put it together. Put it together and have all of those incredible layers moving in those petticoats. Oh, and this is Ah Sing. Ah Sing is a special character who you're about to meet. Ah Sing is the Chinese prostitute. Uh, she starts as a prostitute and she works really, really hard. And so she goes through 10 owners. And she starts uh, by earning $7 and eventually she's earning $100 because she's working so hard. And she intends to free herself. She meets Joe Cannon and she decides this is her ticket to getting out of bondage. Meanwhile, she decides she's going to keep going at it. The American immigration miracle, no matter how degraded and grotesque, what she has to do to make money is every day. She is going to keep working and eventually she will buy a farm. So, oh, that's a Dame Shirley silhouette. Imagine that in those fabrics that you saw a minute ago. And imagine Julia Bullock wearing that. Sensation. So I think if you don't mind, we'll just go right to Ah Sing, right? Let's do it. Let's hear so some music. Let's applaud Rita Ryak. That's her costume. I, I do just want to say that the, the level of research across the board, musically, textually, image wise, is, is incredible in this. And the authenticity that is coming to life on stage, not in a museum way, but in a very real way that 
you know, has certain anachronistic elements that bring it into our own world, but it's been thrilling for me to see that, and, and the team that Peter has assembled, uh, which includes uh, Jim Ingalls, the lighting designer as well, and the, the, the palette that is emerging on this stage is like nothing I have seen on the opera stage, so it's, it's going to be a thrilling uh, visual journey coming up, so thank you for taking us through that, uh, David and Peter. I want to ask John one more question that I'm intrigued about. John, you have spent much of the last two, if not three years, deep in the music of Girls of the Golden West. You, you know this piece so intimately, you're probably uh, dreaming it uh, by this point. How do you as a composer view your own work on opening night of a new opera? Well, opening night is... Uh, I, usually, I don't remember the opening nights, actually. Um, <laughs> You know, because you're, I, I, I generally would prefer to be performing, and, and I end up usually conducting my operas and having a really good time, but I don't think it's a good thing to do on the first performance because I think there's so many things you have to make a judgment about that it's better to let somebody else do it. The only problem is you end up sitting next to somebody who doesn't know they're sitting next to the composer. <laughs> and... Um, I've had some interesting experiences uh, <laughs> sitting with uh, a gentleman at the Met who uh, th I think thought he'd bought a ticket to Turandot um, <laughs> and, and was uh, the moment the music started, uh, you know, his body language was really uh, screaming. And he spent the rest of the first act cleaning out the inbox of his Blackberry, but, but um, I think, you know, if, if we as composers, we're constantly listening for what's wrong. So I, I guess that's the same with all artists. You know, it, it, it's, there are moments when I can take real pleasure in, in what I've done, but they tend to be, I'll be, you know, have my music on and you know, an iPod and be taking a walk in the woods and away from everything, but actually to be in the room and experiencing how the music uh, affects listeners around me is, is it's, it's, it's a really complicated experience. The short message is come to San Francisco in November and December. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank our panelists. Thank the Guggenheim. It's been a pleasure to be with you.